In the first part of chapter 13, we focused on the spine and peripheral nervous system. Here we were able to look at how neurons functioned when they were wired to one another in fairly simple circuits, such as reflexes. The spinal cord contains regions of white matter, which travel up and down from the brain, as well as two regions of gray matter, which look a little bit like Patrick's star. The peripheral nervous system includes the dorsal and ventral roots, which contain just sensory and motor information. These join together to form the spinal nerve, which splits to form the dorsal and ventral ramus, which each connect to the dorsal and ventral sides of the body. There is also a dorsal root ganglion, which contains the cell bodies of sensory neurons, but there is no corresponding structure on the ventral side. Altogether, the peripheral nervous system looks a bit like Squidward. The autonomic nervous system includes the rami communicantes and the sympathetic chain ganglion, which look a bit like plankton. There are three layers of connective tissue surrounding the spinal cord, the pia mater, arachnoid mater, and dura mater. Superficial to the dura mater is the epidural space, and deep to the arachnoid mater is the subarachnoid space, which contains cerebrospinal fluid. This fluid is also located in the central canal found in the gray commissure. The ventral ramus is larger than the dorsal one because it connects to more muscles, including all of the muscles of the arms and legs. In the patellar reflex, a sensory neuron from the muscle sends stretch information to the dorsal side of the spinal column. It synapses on a motor neuron in the ventral horn, whose axon connects back to the muscle causing contraction. In the withdrawal reflex, we also want to cause relaxation of the antagonist muscle. The sensory neuron also stimulates an interneuron in the gray matter. This interneuron will cause an IPSP on another motor neuron, causing it not to fire, which causes the antagonistic muscle to relax, allowing us to withdraw from a stimulus faster. The interneuron is required because neurons can only release one neurotransmitter, and neurotransmitters tend to be either stimulatory or inhibitory. To have a stimulatory effect on one neuron and an inhibitory effect on the other, this required an interneuron to switch the signal. The stretch reflex helps to protect muscles from overstretching, as well as aiding in posture. A muscle will tend to be stretched as we lean to one side. Subsequently, a contraction helps to pull the body back upright. We test this reflex, however, because it is consistent. We test this reflex because it is easy, non-invasive, and consistent. The patellar reflex should be the same on both sides of the body. If not, that might be a sign of a neurodegenerative disease, a type of disease where intervention is best early rather than late. Trying to rely on more complicated behaviors, like did I forget my keys a little bit more often this week than last week, would not be consistent or reliable. Sensory neurons in the peripheral nervous system send information to the spinal cord and synapse in the gray matter. This information is sent up towards the brain in one of the ascending tracks of white matter to the primary sensory cortex. Motor information is sent downwards via a descending tract where it synapses on a motor neuron this information can be sent to muscles. Damage to the spinal cord or damage to this peripheral nerve could disrupt the sensory and motor information. With trauma, it's important to test whether somebody can feel and move all parts of their body. It's also important to test their reflexes. It's possible for a trauma victim to be able to move and feel parts of their body while having diminished or absent reflexes. If only the reflexes are affected, this means that the sensory and motor neurons are okay, as well as the ascending and descending tracks in the spinal cord, but an interneuron, 
that sends information from the sensory to the motor neuron in a reflex has been damaged. As we discussed in the last chapter, this could trigger inflammation in the spinal cord that could lead to further paralysis. On the other hand, if a patient suffered damage to the white matter of the descending tracts or to this motor neuron, they would lose control over a region of their body. Similarly, damage to the sensory neuron or to the ascending tracts of the spinal column would lead to loss of sensation of a part of the body. It is possible to damage just one or the other of these. The virus that causes chickenpox hides its DNA in the dorsal root ganglia. Years later, for reasons that are unknown, the virus erupts again causing shingles. It is able to travel down the nerve easily, but it is harder to spread outwards because of the connective tissue surrounding the nerve. For this reason, shingles erupts along a dermatome or the region of skin innervated by a single spinal nerve.